Welcome everyone to ICANN. We'll be talking to Craig Holler from the Jefferson County Drug Free Coalition. He is going to tell us about himself and the Alcohol and Drug Treatment Court programs. These programs are funded by a grant managed by the Wisconsin Department of Justice. It's called the Treatment Alternative and Diversion Program, or TAD. Open our hearts, free every soul The fear inside, you must let it go Oh, that monster Before it conquers you Yeah We all have demons, we fight every day You get knocked down, but the bell hasn't rang So keep going Just stay focused When life seems hard before life passes you by, you must Like a bird with broken wings always You've got to reach for the stars It might seem far I think the biggest piece of advice I have for someone going through addiction or thinking about going to rehab is being honest with yourself. Don't be afraid to get help. I think that's the biggest stigma that we're trying to erase is, is don't be afraid to ask for help. Hi, welcome back to ICANN. Today we're talking to Craig Holler and welcome Emily Reich as our new co-host. Hello. <laughs> um, today we we're talking about a program that Craig has brought to fruition, I guess you could say. It's called the Treatment Alternative and Diversion Program, short for, or TAD is short for it. Hi, Craig. Hello. Thank you for having me. Um, can you tell us about a little bit about you, what you do, and what you want to see for the future? Yeah, so I'm the uh, Alcohol and Drug Treatment Court Coordinator for Jefferson County. Uh, the programs are diversion programs um, for people charged with, in the alcohol treatment court portion, 
um, OWI third and fourth offenses. And for drug treatment court, any um, nonviolent criminal offense that has as um, a driver of that offense um, substance abuse or alcohol abuse. Okay. And so um, I oversee both of those programs. Um, I also do some policy work for a, a, a committee called the um, Community Justice Collaborating Council. Okay. Um, and so that's a bunch of stakeholders for Jefferson County um, who sort of research and, and drive the um, direction of the local justice system. Where did you begin and how did you come to where you're at now? So I've been with Jefferson County since 2017. Okay. Um, I came specifically to help um, establish the drug treatment court program. Mm -hmm. um, prior to that, I ran the um, Dodge County Alcohol and Drug Treatment Court programs, same, same kind of thing. Um, and prior to that, I worked for corrections for about 19 years. Okay. I noticed you, you said you were a probation officer for a while. Correct. Yep. Um, did that help you with deriving this program? It did. I have a, I gained um, a, a pretty extensive um, knowledge of the, the court system, the local justice system, all the stakeholders, and, and how uh, people can reintegrate into the community after a jail or prison. So it gave you a better outlook on it all? Yep. And this is, treatment courts are just a much more focused um, version of community corrections. Okay. Um, how did this program begin? I guess you said a little bit about it, but tell me a little yeah, deeper. Yeah, so it, it preceded me in Jefferson County, um, obviously. Uh, in 2014, or actually leading up to 2014, uh, Judge William Hugh, um, County Administrator Ben Waymeyer, um, District Attorney Sue Happ, Sheriff, Sheriff Milbrath, and a bunch of other stakeholders identified that uh, Jefferson County had a disproportionate number of repeat drunk drivers. And so treatment courts, which were just getting gaining momentum in the state, um, were one answer to that, a uh, way to focus resources and supervision um, on those repeat offenders. And so you think d this program, does it help change the, the attitude of the people that are participants? It does. Um, we have a very good graduation rate and a very low recidivism for people who complete our program successfully. And so, um, and you can see it anecdotally in, uh, with our graduates, people get through the program and they, f they find that they've repaired relationships with their families, have much more stable employment, um, don't have the instability that comes with um, substance abuse and alcohol abuse, and they've really put their lives back together. You know, you have one for alcohol and one for drugs. How does the two, do the two programs differ any? They're, they're very similar. The, the alcohol treatment court program or the OWI court, um, that has um, attached to it some conditional jail time that's mandatory um, by statute. And so the, the structure, at least initially, is a little bit different, um, but the, the way people progress through the program is the same. Now I know uh, Emily here, mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> she went through that program, <laughs> yep. didn't you? I did, yeah. Um, I guess you could say I'm um, living proof of the, <laughs> the percentage. Um, it definitely helped get me to where I am today. Um, the structure really helped in the beginning and um, you know, it just really helped me get that foundation that I needed um, to, to have you know, extensive sobriety. Um, so I, yeah, it definitely attributes to, to my recovery. <laughs> yeah, and I have to say that Emily is, since she graduated, has been um, certified as a peer support specialist yep, yep. and we, is on the treatment court um, staffing team. Yeah, she brought up a little bit when we interviewed yeah. her last yeah. time yeah. about it, and pretty that's cool. why I decided <laughs> she'd be, be good co-host. Yeah. <laughs> um, I see the program has different phases. Can you describe these different phases and goals for the programs? Yeah, so I won't go through each phase um, individually, right. but generally speaking, you can think of it this way. Um, initially in the program, we want people to have, be under a lot of monitoring, mm -hmm. um, a lot of face-to-face -face contact with case managers, with the judge, um, not too many um, large tasks we ask of them, but we, we want them to really focus on being stable, ha um, getting signed up for insurance and treatment, and then having just a couple weeks of sobriety before they, they transition. Mm -hmm. And as you go through the program, there's five phases in, in both programs. Um, the emphasis goes less from monitoring um, through drug testing or alcohol testing and face-to-face -face contacts. Um, it goes l less monitoring to more support. Mm -hmm. um, so we've transitioned people through treatment, um, through uh, 
AANA uh, community support meetings, and by the time they're ready to graduate, we want to have minimal monitoring uh, besides you know being tested a couple times every week, um, but a lot of wraparound support from family, friends, uh, community support, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. How long does it take for a participant to get through the whole program? Um, if somebody goes through the program without a glitch, it's a, it's a year. Mm -hmm. um, average, I would say, is a, around 16 months. Okay. So what this program actually does is help the participant be more responsible for their actions, is what you're saying. Responsible for their actions and also um, eliminating um, past negative influences mm -hmm. and surrounding people with uh, people who are supportive of their recovery. Mm -hmm. What happens if a person isn't able to finish the program? So a couple things, uh, for everybody in um, the OWI or alcohol treatment court, um, that's a condition of probation. So mm -hmm. um, they've been convicted, they've been placed on probation for a period of time, and the, the alcohol treatment court is a condition of that probation ordered by the judge. Um, if, they, if they don't complete that successfully, they would um, face possible revocation of probation, in which case then they, if, if they are revoked, they would face sentencing. Um, not everybody is always revoked, but it's pretty much the, the standard. Mm -hmm. um, for the drug treatment court program, you can be in the program as a condition of probation, but also as a deferred prosecution agreement. Um, so th that's where the district attorney would say, okay, um, we're charging you with this felony. Um, this, if, if you go through drug treatment court um, and successfully and you graduate, then that felony could be dropped to a misdemeanor or it could be dismissed altogether. That's often how people get into the program that mm -hmm. way. And so that's a huge incentive to be mm -hmm. in yeah. this program because if you, you know, having a felony in your record is, is a difficult thing to overcome. Mm -hmm. And um, having the ability to have that wiped clean um, is a real benefit. Okay. If, say, somebody doesn't make it through, can they get back in the program again or, or is it done? It's typically... Uh, we don't want people going through, recycling through the program. It has happened on a couple of occasions, but basically um, we want to use those resources on people who haven't already been through the program. Okay. Emily, you have a question? Um, I was just going to ask, so being a part of the team, I kind of know um, a little more, but so to, to get into the program, how does that work? Do you have to apply? Yep. Uh, so the, the way it works is you have um, people apply, mm -hmm. um, then they're screened for um, risk and needs. So do they pose a risk to the community uh, because of substance abuse? And do they have a high treatment need? And we have a couple questionnaires or, or um, assessments that we do with them. Um, if they're high risk, high need, and that's all we accept into the program, we mm -hmm. want the people with the, the greatest need. Right. Um, then, um, we would review their criminal history, and folks who have any kind of violence in their history mm -hmm. are, are usually excluded. Um, it has to be a serious violent offense, not just something um, relatively minor, but okay. um, if it's a serious violent offense, we don't want, um, well, statute prohibits us from Okay, even if, folks. like, does it have to be in the, the offense that they are trying to get into treatment court for, or could it be like yeah. years previous? So both. Okay. Um, so if it's a current offense, something that's pending at the time, mm -hmm. that automatically excludes anybody, any kind of violence whatsoever. Um, if it's a prior offense, um, that would have to be something much more serious. Okay, that makes sense. Yep. And so after the screening, um, we determine that they're, that they're eligible. We let the defense attorney and the district attorney's office know that people are eligible. Um, and then the district attorney's office has discretion to make an offer or not. Um, for treatment court outcome or disposition. Okay, so you, you basically have to be offered it as? Correct. Okay. Yep. Got it. So, um, and so if the district attorney's office agrees that this person would be a good fit, they'll make an offer. Um, if the defense um, attorney, the defendant, and the DA all agree, then they usually make a joint recommendation to the judge um, to accept okay. one of these programs. Got it. Yep. Is there, do you have a high percentage of graduation? Um, I have to actually look at my notes because um, I don't have the stats memorized, but for the alcohol treatment court, this, this, our, our stats through May, I'm sorry, through March of this year, um, we have a 70% graduation rate for the awesome. alcohol treatment court. Um, for drug treatment court, we have a 48% graduation rate. Okay. Um, we'll, go ahead, finish. Yep. Yeah. So drug, drug treatment court, um, like I said, the programs are very similar. It's just the population is a little bit um, less stable often. Right. And so... Um, it's the 
graduation rates are a bit lower. Okay. And then you said after graduation, then they can either have a, mis a lower sentence or no sentence at all. That's often one of the incentives used um, um, for the drug treatment court um, is the reduction in charges. Um, some, for some people with much more serious offenses, it might be just simply not uh, avoiding uh, being sentenced to prison. Okay. Um, but it, it, but the, the possibility is often there for people to have a felony uh, disappear. What happens at the graduation itself? Um. So we do two things. Um, it, when people meet other um, program requirements, we have a graduation just individually through them. Um, it's actual, it's a, it's a legal um, proceeding where the court determines that the person has successfully completed this portion or this requirement. Um, but then we of, often have um, about three, four times a year, a graduation celebration where we invite all our graduates oh, um, cool. back. And then we you know, talk, about, talk about their successes, things that they're, they're facing now. Um, you know, we try to use them as an example for current participants on, yes, we know it's a difficult program, but look at these folks have graduated successfully. Um, and then we usually have a keynote speaker who, um, you know, Supreme Court justices, um, graduates of other programs, that sort of thing, mm -hmm. um, sometimes local politicians, um, just to, to honor uh, the, the graduates, the people that have helped them through the program, uh, the, the support that they've received, um, we want to recognize that. Now, after the graduation, is there still support for these people? There is. So that's the, the, really the entire mm -hmm. um, uh, purpose of the program is to help folks while they're in the program develop their own circle of support. So that way they have that going forward. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are, um, well, there's a recovery community that Emily is very mm -hmm. um, involved in. Um, some counties do have a little bit more formal, um, I guess, um, connection with grad way to connect graduates with the recovery community. Mm -hmm. um, we're still um, talking that through, um, but we do try to connect people with the recovery community so they have that support going forward. Mm -hmm. I was going to say too, we do also hold um, an alumni meeting for anybody that has yep. graduated or is currently going through or has attempted to go through treatment court, um, which it's pretty much every other week that we hold this, um, but also as peer support, um, there are occasions where I am able to continue working with somebody even after graduating, yeah. mm -hmm. um, just to kind of have that accountability and support for them in cases where they might not have family, um, even cases they do, and you know, just um, being able to keep, keep uh, in contact and help them through whatever they're going through at the time. Yep. Yeah. And through our work with the Drug Free Coalition, we've tried to establish some other um, non-traditional type of recovery events. Um, sober bowling, for, for example, that... Which, uh, if you will let me oh. break in, I have a check for $1,500 oh, wow. for sober bowling. Hey, that so, is awesome. Good. Thank you. Yeah, those programs are important to right. people. So that it's a free event for yeah. anyone. That's right. So that's, when, that's a big one um, mm -hmm. that's held um, weekly in Jefferson mm -hmm. and then mo monthly in Watertown. Um, mm -hmm. yep. And then we had a, a one-off event last fall, um, like a, a, a bags or cornhole tur tournament in Jefferson on Gamitli Kite. So that was mm -hmm. a good alternative for folks who wanted to be engaged in something on that weekend, mm -hmm. but n not being around drinking. Yeah, that's the hard part with yep. yeah. our community and our lifestyle it, it revolves around alcohol mm -hmm. unfortunately right. every everything you see has alcohol yeah. involved so right. it's got to be so hard for recovering alcoholics to go anywhere right and so the, you know separately from the the treatment courts um one of our focuses on the drug free coalition is to foster and create more opportunities for people to do clean and sober activities mm -hmm. and be away from um, negative influences mm -hmm. Any other questions you have, Amy? Um, not that I can think of off the top of my head. Anything you else you'd like to talk? I know. Um, let's see. Does it seem to be uh, tougher for the alcoholic side rather than the drug-related side to go through these programs? Um, I would say. Well, since both programs are structured similarly, um, you know, the, 
the programs themselves aren't necessarily harder than one is harder mm -hmm. than the other, but what I think is there's a little bit more instability in the population in the drug treatment court. Mm -hmm. um, I'd agree. When they start the program. Yeah. And um, I think the, the nature of the uh, addiction um, lends itself to fewer opportunities for stable employment, for stable right. housing, family ties, that sort of thing. The people in the alcohol treatment court seem to have it a little bit more together when they start the program, which means that you know we have a higher graduation rate, mm -hmm. um, a lower recidivism rate, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's just the nature of the, the substance yeah. and the addiction. And both of them have such a stigma. Right. It's not really, it's an illness. Correct. And it's got to be looked at as an illness, mm -hmm. and too many people don't look at it that way. Right, and that's really the premise of the program. It's um, treating um, substance abuse disorder um, as a medical condition, and then we're mandating treatment as a condition of being in the program. Um, you know, if you have cancer or you break, break an arm, you're going to seek treatment for that. Well, this is right. no different. So we, we, really, we really want to get people connected with the level of care that they need, mm -hmm. and then we monitor that and encourage that throughout the program. Mm -hmm. Do you think we have enough medical care for our, the drug addiction and the alcohol addiction? I would say we're, we're never going to have enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I know that Jefferson County, in human services in particular, has made huge strides in the level of programming that they offer. Mm -hmm. um, we have intensive outpatient uh, programs for both men and women. Um, they have. Um, varying di gr different groups and individual therapy, and they are willing to contract and refer people to um, more intensive um, residential programs, residential like treatment, um, partial hospitalization, that sort of thing, um, if it's not offered in-house. So, mm -hmm. um, so I think the, the, um, the level of services that's needed is there. Mm -hmm. um, it's just not, it might not be housed within mm -hmm. the county system. Have you noticed a big increase of uh, well, I know fentanyl has been in the forefront for the last year. Have you noticed a big increase of the overdoses and that in this area? Um, yes, and so, so not necessarily with people in our program, but I have heard and have conversations with other stakeholders in the county where overdoses um, are a real problem. Um, I know in, with our, our population in particular, methamphetamine is a real big um, okay. a problem right now and, and for the past several months. So Why do you think that is? Um, I think some people are just getting away from opioids um, because of fear of overdose. Okay. And so, um, so they're making a somewhat conscious, right. mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. <laughs> at least they're not wanting to die right. because I have heard from different areas that the fentanyl high is so addictive that they're willing to die for it. Mm -hmm. Right, it's very powerful. Um, and it's unfortunate. And I know that there's been a lot of effort at harm reduction through human services, through the health department, through the Drug Free Coalition. Mm -hmm. Safe um, Communities is yeah. very much Is there anything harm else reduction. that programs like the Elks can do to help get the word out about your programs or? Yeah, so maybe not necessarily with the alcohol and drug treatment courts. I mean, people are, are, are charged with an offense. Everybody's aware that the programs exist and they apply accordingly. I think it would be very helpful to continue to try to destigmatize um, substance right. abuse disorder um, and help um, educate folks on the availability of Narcan and other harm reduction strategies mm -hmm. and then help to build the support community. Yeah, um, the Elks are working on the Narcan. Yeah. Uh, we just got, we're getting ours installed in the Elks building in Main Ang. Oh, excellent. Oh, awesome. And the Green, no, Eau Claire Lodge just got one installed in theirs too. Okay, so great. I've been working with, because I'm the state chair too, I've okay. been working on getting that into the different lodges. Yeah, I think, I think giving anybody a chance who, who's suffering from substance abuse disorder a chance to, you know, avoid overdose or mm -hmm. minimize the harm that happens um, so they have that chance to get into recovery. Um, that's you know that's the most we can do for them at that at that moment. And that was the hardest part of getting it in the building is getting past that stigma, because mm -hmm. a lot of the people that I talk to they're kind of think, well, they keep taking the drugs. Why give them something to reverse it? Right. And or even keep, being naive to think that you know someone of a higher stature yeah. can't can't be. Um, you know, a drug addict. Yeah, because right. it could affect anybody. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 
you know, your children, your grandchildren, your parents. Yeah. And that, that shows a, a lack of understanding of how addiction and, and mm -hmm. um, substance abuse disorder works on the brain. Um, people aren't making conscious decisions, and so you need to give them a chance um, to get the help they need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I come from a family of alcoholics, so I do understand mm -hmm. more so than most people, and that's why this, my program and all these programs are so important to me. Well, thank you for doing them. Yeah. Anything else you'd like to add? Um, I don't think so. I, I think um, I really appreciate the elk support, uh, especially for silver bowling. This is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, and I think just, you know, community wide, if we can just, you know, gather together and try to get uh, or create opportunities for people to participate in the community in a substance free way, yep. Yep. Um, I think that's going to go a long way to changing some norms yep. um, where the expectation isn't that you're drinking or using, the expectation is that you're not, and that. Um, a, a safe environment that's going to be available to everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you both for being here today. Thank you so yes. much, Craig. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I hope to see you again. Emily, we'll see you next time. All right. Sounds good. Thank you, everybody. And remember, alcohol and drug abuse, it affects every area of life. It affects women, men, children, grandchildren, young, old, rich, poor. It's not just like it used to be. It was just somebody that was homeless or whatever. So give, a, give everybody a chance. See you next time. <laughs>